Okay, everybody, we are going to try this. Recording a video on my phone so that I can say hello. Um, fight evil, read books is the theme of today. This is my favorite shelf of books. Um, just kidding, I lied. This is one of my other favorite shelves because these are all of my word books. If you ever need uh, tips on puns or cussing and the morphology and kind of like the word-based etymology of it, let me know. And it's good to see you all. Um, thanks again for conferences and for work, helping work through the snafus with some of this audio recording. Um, today I'm going to get into our last little bit of lecture for this project. Um, a lot of styling convention type stuff. Get ready for grammar. I'm super psyched. I hope you are too. And here we go. I think I have my microphone set up, but from my testing, it is pretty quiet, so if you need to adjust the volume, I'm going to try to do that in video editing, uh, but I do apologize if that's a little wonky. So, back to our video update, we have our course objectives for the week, again focusing on some of these big components that are going to make this a strong project for you. This is an academic paper, we are focused on logos, that's the biggest part of your rubric, and we're working still to build ethos and a little bit of pathos. Hopefully, through this revision process, uh, you'll be able to put all of those elements together and finish your argument out strongly this week. A couple last-minute questions that I've seen. Uh, from P2 to P3, you can absolutely use information from that project. We found quotes in the annotated bibliography. Some of your personal connections might be relevant, too. So feel free to lift some of those from P2. I'm looking at that like process work for this project. P3, as you keep coming back to your stakeholders, as you keep restating your purpose, as you continue to make some of those connections, it might feel pretty repetitive, and that's probably okay. That's going to make uh, that's going to help reinforce your argument for an audience who hasn't read this before. As far as organization, because this is a little bit longer of a paper. Uh, you might choose to keep subheadings like we did in P2. Double check the MLA format, the student examples that you have are correctly done, but you might choose to keep some subheadings to outline some of those big sections that you're introducing. The Writing Center is still open. I do still have office hours next week, so those are on a slightly different schedule. You have a lot of resources in Canvas. Make sure that you keep coming back to these materials as you're revising, as you're continuing to draft. Like I said, we do have those student samples for you. Just a reminder, those are all uh, linked for you in our module if you click on the P3 online coursework. The very bottom of that page is where I post all of those handouts, so feel free to look there uh, if you're looking for those resources or uh, anything else we've covered this, uh, this project. One more reminder on the introduction and conclusion since you just drafted your conclusion. Introductions, of course, are the upside-down triangles, starting big and getting very specific. Conclusions are going to do the opposite, restating the main idea, and then branching back out to restate some of those big ideas. Quick note on MLA, as you're citing, um, make sure that you are using multiple authors correctly, that you're including page numbers, that you have even the italics and uh, uh, punctuation correct. I do have notes on those in your P2. So make sure that you check out any of that blue hiding, highlighting specifically. Okay, now we're to the fun bit, the grammar and editing parts. Um, and this is adapted from um, Anne Rehm's book, so we're going to go through kind of these four different sections and make sure that you've got a strong argument. Uh, a lot of these are sentence-level things, but they speak to bigger, uh, bigger fundamental uh, pieces that contribute to your logos and ethos. So, let's check out cutting. Um, repetition and redundancy we talked a little bit about in P1. As you look through your work, see which pieces um, are most meaningful. Uh, this can help kind of with, with cohesion, making sure that your argument is well organized, uh, making sure that you're not, ident uh, not repeating the same thing. Um, my note at the bottom thinking about your topic with key phrases, um, if you have um, very specific terms for your paper, identifying some of these and seeing how many times you're saying them throughout a paragraph or throughout a piece uh, or throughout a sentence can be really helpful to see some of that repetition. Identifying these and, uh, and other synonyms can be a good way to help 
vary your language. Another piece is checking for action. This can make your work a little bit faster paced. Using an active voice instead of passive voice is going to make your work much more clear, much more direct. So uh, if you look at, let's take a look at these examples. Passive voice, there was a discussion of the healthcare system. There was is where we see that passive voice. It's not clear who is who the actor is in this sentence. The next sentence has been revised. The politicians discussed the healthcare system. We have a much clearer sense of who's doing the action and what's happening. Passive voice takes away from that responsibility, can take away from that. Um, it re ultimately kind of just takes away from your sentence. So look for some of these constructions in your writing as you revise. Connecting, making sure that your sentences all kind of mesh well together. Um, a lot of these help build logical connections. It can help develop your writing and vary the sentence structure. If you realize you have a lot of short, choppy sentences or a lot of really long sentences, it's probably because of these connections. In coordinating, you have two complete clauses. So, for example, my sentence here, I'm going to try to model these for you. Coordinating conjunctions connect to complete clauses. That could be its own sentence, but we're connecting two complete sentences with a comma using one of these coordinating conjunctions. So, a full sentence must follow. A full sentence must follow is also a complete sentence. When you connect them with a coordinating conjunction, you have a clear compound sentence. So, fan voice. We have our several uh, several options for these kind of coordinating conjunctions. So uh, you can use this as a mnemonic to go through and figure out if you're joining your sentences appropriately. In subordinating conjunctions, you're connecting a dependent clause with an independent clause, basically an incomplete sentence with a complete sentence. So our first example here. If you use a subordinating conjunction, we have it introducing this dependent clause, this incomplete idea that kind of leaves it hanging. The second part has to be a complete sentence. A sentence, a full sentence must follow. So, the, uh, incomplete sentence, complete sentence, connected or signaled by this subordinating conjunction. You've got lots of choices here, so keep these in mind as you're putting your sentences together. If you have a phrase with just one of these ideas, probably incomplete. Transitions are another way to help join information. So, when we make these logical connections, you can use a semicolon. You also have um, colons to introduce lists, commas. You've got lots of options on how to introduce a transition. So. I'll give you a few moments in your own work to go through this to see what you can find on your own. Take a look at some of these different ideas. I've given you kind of guidelines on how to circle these, how to find them. Um, so if you need to go back, feel free. But take a look, see if you can find some of these examples. When you're done, hit play. The last piece is going to be choosing the best words. Now that you know a lot more about the topic, you can use a more specific vocabulary in order to do that. For example, we have two uh, two sample sentences here. First, the dog barks at me. It's okay, we know what happened, but if we have more specific language, we can replace it with the mastiff snarled menacingly at me. Then we begin to understand the, the situation much more clearly. Same here. The working conditions were gross versus the labor conditions were disgusting. We have a much better sense of what's happening in this uh, example uh, and a much clearer picture, a little bit more sophisticated vocabulary for what's happening. Often these have to do with connotation, so kind of the, um, the emotions or the thoughts, the kind of uh, background ideas that go with the word. So crowd versus mob. You have very different connotations of what those groups are doing and who forms them, what they look like, how they behave. There's very different, there's a big difference between a crowd and a mob. Looking for vague words can also help too. This is one thing that might help with your stakeholder especially. So when you talk about people or groups, name that stakeholder again instead. The more specific your language, the more targeted you can make it feel for your audience. 
same thing. Go back and look for some of this vague language. See if you can replace some of these words with more specifically to help improve your arguments, to help paint a clearer picture of what you're talking about. And we'll move on. We talked about logical fallacies last week. Some of this comes down to your word choice as well. As you think about absolutes, any, uh, any very strict rules that you give, for example, saying all people never do this, always, everyone, none. A lot of these indicate that you might be heading toward a logical fallacy. It's very rare that every single person, everyone, believes this idea. Instead, you can use hedging language and use some of these um, less, uh, these more forgiving words. Often, many, may, occasionally. The other one to avoid are if-then statements. Uh, we get to this when we look at uh, like slippery slope arguments and false equivalencies. Um, oh, there's a few more too. But if you use if-then statements, it's not usually so simple, and you need to explain how this series of events goes together. As you're working, uh, continue playing, paying close attention to the rubric, paying attention to the assignment sheet. Excuse me. Um, if reading out loud help, helps you, that would be great. Uh, in the reverse outline, as you go back through each paragraph that you've already written, try and figure out the purpose. Try and figure out excuse me, uh, what you were trying to say in each paragraph or the purpose. Reading backwards, so starting with the last sentence, to the second to last sentence, to the third to last sentence, is a great editing strategy that will help you catch some of those mistakes. Um, or, if you've done a lot of work on this, put it away. Take a day off. Uh, hopefully that will help you kind of clear your mind and come back to this a little bit fresher with a little bit clearer eyes. As you submit, I am asking you for one thing that we haven't done before. For this last paper, since this will not build into the next one, I'm asking you what kind of commentary you'd like. For instance, in past projects, I've given you rub a rubric, marginal comments, as I kind of uh, comment as I'm... Oops, as I comment as I'm reading, just like your peers do in peer review, and I give you a summary comment in a par in paragraph form at the end. You can still have all of that, and I'm happy to provide it for you. If, however, you really prefer one of those types of comments, let me know, and I'll just prefer marginal, or I'll just write marginal comments, or I'll just write an end comment. The other option, if you're not interested in this feedback, or if you won't look at it after the semester, to say that we've had a lot going on the last month. Uh, is an understatement. So if this isn't going to be useful for you, let me know and I'll still attach the rubric so that you can see clearly how you were marked on this project, but it will save me a ton of time if I'm not going through and providing some of this feedback that you won't use. So, if you don't, if you don't want it, that's also fine. There's no judgment either way, no matter what you choose, and um, I'll just provide what you ask for. If you don't leave a comment asking for a specific type of feedback, You'll just get the rubric. And I think that's it. Oh no, sorry, one more thing. For the extension. If you'd like to use your extension, you have until Saturday, May 2nd to get in touch with me. If you choose to do this, uh, there's no grading penalty, there's no judgment. Your new due date will be Wednesday, May 6th at 11.59pm. That's three days or 72 hours after the original deadline. Um, if you're having any trouble with this, even if you've already used your extension, no matter what's going on, um, the most important thing for me is that we continue to communicate. So, if you feel like you need more time, please let me know. As for the syllabus, if I don't hear from you, I am going to follow those rules, and I am going to kind of out go with um, what the syllabus says. So, you'll get uh, deducted 10% if you've submitted 24 hours late, so posting sometime on Monday. It will be a 20% deduction if you submit 40, uh, 48 hours late, sometime on Tuesday. If you don't submit by Tuesday, you will receive a zero for this assignment, and the syllabus does outline that you will fail the class if you do not turn in a one of these major projects. So, again, if you're struggling, if you need time, if there's anything that I can do for you, please be sure to get in touch so that I can help. And now we're really done. So, for the Wednesday prompt for our discussion this week, tell me a strength and weakness, something that
that has been really helpful and meaningful to you in this project, something that you feel really comfortable with, and tell me something that you might need help with. Ask your peers if they can help you figure something out. If you have questions about how to use resources, about scholarly resources, stakeholders, you've covered a lot of rhetorical concepts, what questions do you have about this project? So, a strength, something that you've done really well with this project, and something that you might need help with before we turn in this final paper. With that, as I don't have a word limit for you, uh, so I'll give you some time. Please respond to two peers trying to look for something that uh, you might be able to help your peers with. As they're asking questions, see if you can answer their questions. Sunday, technically there's no Sunday assignment since you'll just submit your final. Please include a comment for whatever type of commentary you would like, and uh, I'll see you next week for our last unit.